Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute, waiting for everybody to come in from the waiting room. Hello, hello. Thank you for being here. Going to wait to let everybody in from the waiting room, let everybody get all set up. So glad you could join us tonight, talking about LGBTQ caregivers. We're gonna be hearing from some fascinating researchers on the subject. So I'm glad you're here to listen firsthand. You'll be able to ask questions as part of this webinar. So otherwise people are gonna be watching the recording. So you get to see it firsthand. Is everybody in from the waiting room now? Looks like perhaps. Looks like it. So let me go, go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody. Can you see me? Am I coming up on your screen? Let me see in the chat box. Are the, the people who are not, not members of who are going to be speaking tonight, but people who are in the audience, can you see me and hear me? Just want to make sure, because I can't see myself for some reason when I'm talking. So nothing's coming in the chat box. So I'm not sure if people can see me. Yep, Xander, we got a few thumbs up from folks out there. So it looks like we're oh, good to go. I, I can't see them. There we go. Okay, okay perfect. perfect. So hello, hello everybody and welcome. My name is Xander Kegg. I am uh, one of the co-founders of the LGBTQ Caregiver Center. And I'm gonna be your program host tonight or today. If you're in another time zone, I'm on the East Coast. So it's evening here. Uh, but before we begin, there are a couple of brief housekeeping items that I wanna review with you. And I wanna share a little bit with you about the LGBT Caregiver Center. So the LGBT Caregiver Center is an initiative of the Caregiver Wellness Collective Incorporated, which is a new nonprofit startup. The LGBTQ Caregiver Center aims to raise awareness of the unique challenges faced by the LGBTQ caregiver community and those who care for LGBTQ individuals, uh, those who empower LGBTQ care in caregivers, also to live with pride and dignity, and also to serve as a conduit for education, wellness, training, and research. The center provides information and resources. We deliver training and innovative services to enhance the health wellness of our LGBTQ caregivers. And that's through our other initiative, which is yoga for caregivers. During the course of this webinar, we respectfully ask for all participants to keep in mind that all people are welcome uh, to participate in this workshop. We consider this a safe space for all diverse caregivers, advocates, and community members. And we ask that you hold space for differences in thoughts, and values and that all audience members listen deeply and actively and that you suspend judgment while having the courage to raise questions and to reflect on the information that's provided to you. This is an interactive session and we encourage active participation, lively discussion. So please feel free to share questions in the chat box. We will be monitoring that. Um, we'll, and we're gonna do our best to read them out loud and to address them individually. So this program is being recorded. I uh, wanna let you know that. So you'll be able to go back and look at it at a later date if you'd like. Um, and you can also share it with people through our YouTube channel, which I'll share a link for that in the chat box in just a moment. Uh, we'd like for you to share links that I'm going to be providing to you. One is for our YouTube channel and one is for our Facebook community. So let me drop those into the chat box now. You can have those. So this video, once it's recorded and uh, up on the web, it will be at our YouTube channel and we'll also be sharing it out on our Facebook group. So now let's just jump right into why you're all here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today our presenters, Drs. Whitney Wharton and Jason Flatt. Just a little bit of information about each of them and just a brief introduction also about what they'll be talking about. Dr. Whitney Wharton is a cognitive neuroscientist specializing in Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Her research focuses on the influence of vascular risk factors on Alzheimer's biomarkers in individuals who are at risk for the disease due to parental history. 
Dr. Wharton is currently conducting a National Institutes of Health and National Institute on Aging funded study investigating the influence of peripheral arter arterial function. Oof, <laughs> let me say that one more time. Peripheral arterial function on Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And she's also conducting a clinical trial that will determine the effects of an FDA approved blood pressure medication on Alzheimer's disease. Um, she's also conducting a clinical trial that will determine the effect, oh, excuse me, um, her, in addition to that, she's working on research that involves the influence of sex hormones and hormone therapy on cognition and Alzheimer's disease neuropathology, and is also working on that FDA approved blood pressure med medication that research is specifically working uh, with African Americans. Uh, Dr. Jason Flatt is an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Public Health. His current research uh, looks at how to better understand the concerns and needs of the LGBTQIA plus people living with Alzheimer's disease and their families. He also teaches uh, courses on community-based participatory research and public health theory. He's funded by the National Institutes on Health and the National Institute on Aging as part of a career award exploring dementia risk in LGBTQIA older adults and another grant focused on recruitment and engagement of LGBTQIA plus older adults living with dementia and their care partners. Overall, what they're gonna be dis discussing tonight is focused on LGBTQIA identified individuals who are caregivers um, and uh, dementia and Alzheimer's uh, related diseases. Uh, to just give you some context, over 3 million or more adults age 60 plus live in the United States who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and or another identity, which is LGBTQIA+. That's how we abbreviated it. Less is known though about the dementia risk within our community. And so Drs. Wharton and Flatt will be discussing the risk for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and related risk factors among LGBTQIA plus adults uh, from multiple studies. They'll also be highlighting the healthcare, the social, and the related challenges ex is experienced by LGBTQIA plus people and provide some relevant resources for the caregivers that are with us tonight. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I introduced Dr. Wharton first. Um, I believe perhaps Dr. Flat might go first. That's that, correct. I'll go ahead yes. and share my slides and we'll Thank get started. You. Yeah. Great to be here and nice to see everyone. Let me make sure. How's it looking for you? Are you seeing the, the main slide? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for having us. And what I'm hoping to do is give you a little background on like, what is the research currently saying? What are we seeing? Um, I'll start off with like giving you a little background of like all the terms that I'm going to be using tonight, show some evidence, then uh, link you to some of the resources that we currently are aware of and that we need to do more work to increase those. And then uh, also then I'll pass it off to Dr. Wharton, who's going to share more about some of the research, but also some exciting efforts that we have in the works. Uh, that we're actually working with the LGBT Caregiver Center to do. So um, this will be a really great discussion. Uh, we'll save questions for the end, but if you have something really burning, put it in the chat and we'll make sure that we get to it. So thanks so much for being here. So I wanted to get us on the same page in terms of terminology that I'll be using today and talking about dementia. So the first term you're going to hear about is cognition. And when I'm referring to cognition, this is really, I'm thinking about people's memory and thinking skills, right? And there's different ways we can measure it to sort of encompass all this. It could be memory. We could look at, for instance, people, how quickly can they do something that involves multitasking? So uh, when I'm mentioning cognition, that's what I'm referring to are these memory and thinking skills. You'll also hear the term dementia. And when I say dementia, that's really an umbrella term that represents, right, a set of different symptoms, right, that a person is having these changes to their brain that are going to affect things like their memory and thinking skills, but also their ability to do everyday tasks. So that's what I'm referring to. You'll see in this umbrella, right, 
the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. We often hear more about this one because the main sort of symptom has to do with memory loss, right? And so that's one of the most noticeable symptoms. And really with this disease, what happens is it has to do with some of the changes to parts of the brain that are involved in memory. You'll also think about things like vascular dementia, right? This has to do with the cardiovascular system, as well as Lewy body dementia, and then frontotemporal dementia. So you can see those are a little less common. You'll also hear another umbrella term that I use, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And so what this encompasses is basically all types of dementia that may have some type of issue with memory and thinking skills. You'll also hear the term mild cognitive impairment potentially, right? And when we think about mild cognitive impairment, this has to do with when someone is diagnosed, they basically assess their cognitive abilities and they see that there are noticeable and measurable declines in their memory and thinking skills, as well as some of their ability to do everyday activities. And then the final one you're here about is more focused on when we're collecting data from populations, it's subjective cognitive decline. And this is where someone just self-reports. Are you having any problems with your memory or thinking that's been getting worse or uh, more noticeable over the past year? And so this is just a way to kind of get at, right? Someone's self-report of, am I having any problems? Sometimes it's accurate and other times it may be due to something else. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have dementia or are at risk for dementia if you're having these subjective cognitive decline concerns. But what it does concern is that you should talk to your healthcare providers about it. So I'll share more about that. You're also going to hear me using the umbrella terms for LGBTQIA plus people. And I know we are familiar with these, but I wanted to share how I'm kind of conceptualizing them based on the field I come from. And so we refer to uh, sexual minority people are individuals who would self-identify perhaps as asexual, bisexual, gay, lesbian, queer, or use a different term, but they do not self-identify as heterosexual primarily. Then you'll hear the term gender minority as well. And this refers to people who self-identify as maybe transgender or non-binary, or they use another term, right? But it reflects a gender identity or expression that doesn't necessarily align with some of the social and cultural expectations of a binary sex, right? Male and female. Um, and so it's important to know this is encompassing people all also that are born intersex. And so this represents people who have differences in um, their chromosomes, how their body responds to hormones, or even their um, reproductive anatomy, right? And so what that shows us is even sex assigned at birth is not binary because we know people are born with differences in their physical bodies. And then you'll hear the term cisgender often when I'm referring to reference groups. And so cisgender represents people whose gender identity aligns with the sex that was assigned to them at birth. It's important to note that both you can be both a sexual minority and a gender minority, right? These are two different concepts, as well as people may use the term like queer to encompass the diversity of both their sexual and gender identities. And it's also important as we're working with groups as we age, right, that this can change over time. Sexual orientation and gender identity can evolve over the lifespan. And so it's important that in the work that we share that we reassess this with groups to understand, right, the differences over time. I also so wanted to share just this figure I really love that represents sort of the umbrella in which sexual orientation and gender identity can fall under. This comes from this trans student educational resource, and I really love the gender unicorn because it sort of embodies 
visually what I've just been talking about. And then on the right, you'll see I wanted to show a wordle that highlights the different identities that people may use to reflect their gender identity. And so it shows you just the the depth of diversity in our community. And so it's important that we honor that. The piece that I really uh, base my work in is really thinking about the historical and social impact of LGBTQ plus equality and how our community has faced these challenges over time. And so here I show really one of the big pivotal movements in our country in terms of equality for the LGBTQIA plus community. And this is that the Stonewall riots in New York City, where two trans women of color, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, led the fight for equality for our community on June 28, 1969. And this is really why we celebrate Pride every month is to honor what our trailblazers, our, our Stonewall rioters have brought in terms of LGBT rights for our community. And it's one of the reasons we have the privileges that we do have today. And I think that it's also important that we acknowledge, right, the hardships that our past generations have had to overcome to progress our rights. And many of those challenges impact their health as they get older. And so it's important that we understand that context. And this is just a sort of a highlight, some of the historical moments in time for LGBTQ history. So I just am highlighting here when the Stonewall riots happened, right? Some of the efforts around creation of the rainbow flag, as well as us not even seeing for nearly, you know, 30 years where we see finally movements in terms of same sex marriage equality um, in 50 states. So just as important to acknowledge, right? When I'm talking about the challenges faced by our community, I think it's important important that we also take into account historically how our community has been oppressed and discriminated against over their lifetime. And so when we're studying health and we think about LGBTQ plus people, we may be more apt to be like, oh, they have all these health problems, but we also have to understand, look what they've uh, accomplished and what they've had to overcome during their lifetime in terms of rights and equality. So LGBTQ plus elders, Xander had shared a bit about right what we know in terms of we know there's at least over a million adults in the US that are age 65 and older. When it comes to thinking about some of our caregiving concerns, one of the big pieces for our community is about living alone and being single. And so you can see here, right, that we know our community is twice as likely to be single as they get older as well as often because of a lot of the historical and political pieces, we have not had the same rights in terms of being able to have children. And so we know that uh, biological children or adopted children play a major role in caregiving and support. And so we know that this is not a resource that many of our LGBTQIA plus community members can rely on. We also know that due to the some of these historical issues and what we've seen even if we go back all the way to the 1950s with the McCarthy era where LGBTQ people were being uh, searched in the government and terminated from their job uh, we know that our community faces unique economic challenges in fact estimates suggest like a third of uh, elders are living in poverty right and then there's the piece around accessing welcoming and inclusive care. And this is another area that we're really working to bolster because we know that our community does not feel comfortable in disclosing their identity to their health care providers. And this isn't just a like, oh, just because I don't want to share. This is because of past experiences with discrimination, stigma, unequal treatment in healthcare, right? Or even denial of healthcare. And we continue to see some of these laws being passed in certain states or movements of trying to get them passed, where it's basically trying to take away the ability of people to receive affirming care. So it's important that we acknowledge these are challenges that caregivers will have to face in our country, depending on where you live in the communities that you're interacting with. 
And so when it comes to really thinking about the number that are living with Alzheimer's disease, we don't have exact estimates yet. It's because much of the national data and the studies that are out there have not been asking about LGBTQIA plus identities, but current estimates put it up to around 350,000 people in our community are currently living with Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia. And we know that when they're living with dementia, it's a, a enormous challenge right? It creates lots of challenges in terms of accessing care, uh, being able to get inclusive services. And so here at the bottom, I show an image of some of these key issues, right? Cornerstones of successful aging, economic security, social connections, and having access to health care that promotes wellness. Right, and these are key challenges for our community, especially around experiencing discrimination, right? Reliance on chosen family. We know that a lot of work, you know, in caregiving has often focused on biological families, and many of our LGBTQ plus community members can't rely on biological family for care or support. And then the healthcare challenges. So this image I show here just highlights some of the unique challenges, and especially for LGBT elders around mental health, higher rates of disability. Again, we believe linked to the historical and ongoing challenges they've had to face, right? Uh, as well as other challenges around economics. When it comes to dementia, I wanted to share, right? These are what we currently know. Right, about over 7% of our community is, who's uh, age 50 and older is currently living with dementia. One of the major concerns we have are the higher rates of some of the risk factors in our community that we know are health disparities. So higher rates of depression, an LGBTQ plus person living with depression has a two times increase in risk of getting dementia later. As well as we see some of the risk factors, things like living with HIV, we know HIV impacts the brain and can uh, increase someone's risk for what is called an HIV associated neuro um, cognitive disorder, uh, which presents much like some of the Alzheimer's disease symptoms. We know that the other challenges that come around are, right, when someone is living with dementia, accessing support can be a challenge. This is both in terms of many people live alone, as well as the healthcare challenges I've shared, but Alzheimer's disease is the most expensive disease in our country. And we know that our community faces unique economic challenges. So this is an area that really policy change advocacy is greatly needed for our community. This is a report that came out in 2018 that I just wanted to highlight. If you wanted to learn more about what's the current evidence, what is SAGE and the Alzheimer's Association doing about this in this space, I wanted to share this issue brief that they put out. So there's a link right there at the bottom to get the report. So now I'm going to move into some of our research and what we've been finding. And so this study that Dr. Wharton and I both were on focused on subjective cognitive decline among LGBTQ plus people. And what was really great is the CDC was extremely supportive of this work and they actually put out on the right, this is a, a infographic that they created that's available on the CDC's webpage. And so what we highlight here was that LGBTQ plus people were more likely to report having problems with their memory and thinking and saying that it was happening more often or getting worse in the past year. So what we see here is about 16% in our community versus 11%. And so that equates to about one in seven people in our community compared to around one in 10 for non-LGBTQ people. The other concern with this had to do with its impact on the daily lives. And so here you see, right, 80% of 
people with SCD that were LGBTQ reported they had at least one chronic condition, condition, as well as one in three said that their memory and thinking challenges interfered with their ability to do social activities, work, or volunteer. So we know that this is a major concern for our community, and there's a need for greater work to one, educate, to screen if someone is having memory issues, we really wanna encourage them to go to their doctor, but we need to make sure that those providers are inclusive and welcoming. So we decided to look at this data one step further to see about the subgroups in the community, who was experiencing the greatest reports of these problems with their memory and thinking. Well, we saw actually that it was highest among bisexual, non-transgender or cisgender individuals. We found it also higher among lesbian cisgender women, as well as people who identified their sexual orientation as another identity. And then finally, we saw higher concerns among transgender individuals as well. So we believe that these are going to be some priority groups that we really need to be thinking about our work in terms of increasing access to caregiving, increasing access to caregiving support, as well as thinking about novel programs to help the community. I think it was unique that we did not see higher rates among gay cisgender males. We saw that that was actually very similar to what we saw for heterosexual males and females. So we do believe that this is linked to some of what we see in terms of health disparities, but also the unequal distribution of resources within the LGBTQ plus community. So these highlight some of those challenges I already said in terms of comparing LGBTQ plus to non LGBTQ plus. And so we did see that they were more likely if they had subjective cognitive decline to report that they had to give up day-to-day -day activities. Very relevant and knowledgeable, I know, of caregivers you're dealing with this, right? Of loved ones not being able to do some of the activities that they used to, as well as needing more help with household tasks and being able to stay engaged in daily life, things like doing social activities. We also saw, you know, they were less likely to talk to their healthcare provider but it didn't differ by sexual orientation or gender identity. So everybody was less likely to talk to their healthcare provider. And we believe this is because of concerns of losing independence for perhaps, you know, if you are diagnosed with dementia, right, you usually lose your driver's license. And so this is a huge concern for the community and we don't have plans in place to help people with transportation, especially if you're living in a rural or non-urban community. I then wanted to shift and share with you some research that comes out of Northern California. This is some work from my career development award. I've been looking at data from Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, obviously a very unique place in the world, especially for LGBTQ plus people in terms of rights and equality over time. But what we wanted to look at was using medical record data to see if there were differences in the rates of dementia diagnosis by sexual orientation. And so we were able to compute this by basically pulling the codes from the medical record from 1996 to 2015. This is more, I won't jump in depth, but this is sort of the analytical approach that we took given the data's longitudinal. And so we did look at, we wanted to stratify uh, our models by gender. Uh, really, it's probably uh, sex uh, because they don't ask gender identity, but we wanted to look at this because we know that in the national data that uh, women have a higher risk for dementia. So this is just a little background on the sample. So we had nearly 4,300 or a um, little more than that. Uh, for LGB and then heterosexual. What we found among the cohort was that the LGB people were younger. Uh, they were also more likely to have a higher college degree or higher years of education. Uh, they were more likely to never have been married and more likely to live alone. 
So we wanted to think about in terms of risk factors, but also things that might protect you from getting dementia. What do these look like for LGB people? Well, we saw they were younger. So age is one of the major risk factors for dementia. Education. So it's widely known that higher levels of education can be protective from developing dementia, as well as, you know, help to delay the onset of symptoms. And so we see higher education in the LGBT group. But we also saw more higher rates of depression in the group, which was, again, depression is associated with a two-fold increase in risk. And then HIV, we saw a higher number of LGB people living with HIV, also a risk factor. So in terms of looking at the prevalence, this is just how many people had a dementia diagnosis total when we looked at it in 2007. Well, we saw the rates were lower for LGB people, which was really a promising sign for us. We were happy to see that given some of the other work. But when we looked at the age of at which people were being diagnosed, it was concerning to us. We saw that LGB people were being diagnosed with dementia nearly one and a half years earlier than their heterosexual counterparts. So again, a concern for us. So when we run this in our statistical model to look at what are the differences in dementia risk, this is what we found. So we found that dementia risk was 23% higher for lesbian and bisexual females compared to heterosexual females. So that does suggest there's a major concern for this member of the community, right? No differences for men in terms of risk. So what this suggests are right in this cohort who has access to healthcare from Kaiser, right? we're seeing a difference in their risk for dementia. And so we believe that this suggests that more research is needed, as well as when we're thinking about caregiving, we need to be bolstering services and supports for our lesbian and bisexual female community members, because there may be a concern, right, around dementia risk, but even long-term providing care and ensuring that they have access to services and supports. So an area that we hope that more research can help to answer. Again, it's important to point out some limitations, right? We did account for age, race, ethnicity, those pieces. One of the unique pieces is when I account for the differences in depression, there's no longer a significant difference for uh, lesbian and bisexual females. And so that suggests that right there, that depression is some way in some way involved in this. And so it may be important also for efforts to target uh, lesbian and bisexual women who are depressed, especially in later life, because this is a, a potential concern around risk for dementia for the community. And so if we can think about early ways of treating or even preventing, right, this could really help as a, a next step to address the community's needs. So moving this to more practical pieces, I've shared some data with you, but we need a lot more work, right? This is just a snapshot of sort of what we know, and there are a lot of gaps. And so the big piece that we are recommending is to focus on things like screening and education. So screening, I mean, screening people who are having memory challenges, right? They're noticing that their memory has been getting worse or that they've been having more issues. Well, it's important to encourage them to get a cognitive screen. And then if that indicates they are having a problem, then they may want to go meet with a specialist, perhaps schedule an appointment with a neurologist to get a further workup to understand and catch if you are experiencing these problems, there are things you can do, plan ahead, as well as access different services to try to cope with that. We also need greater education for people to understand, you know, what are the services available? What is a potential concern? When should you talk to a healthcare provider? When should you seek out additional supports? So a lot of that is needed. We also need to do some things around prevention. So one of the big pieces, at least, of what we know for dementia prevention is around right promoting physical activity and a healthy lifestyle, right? So things like 
uh, you know, eating more healthfully, moderation in uh, alcohol use, some of those pieces can be really important. And so we need some unique resources for our community, as well as really looking at if you need care, how can we make sure that you're getting care that's meeting your needs, it's welcoming, and your loved ones can trust that you're getting the care high, that is high quality. We also, I think a way that we can bolster this work is to return to a lot of our, our movements and building in terms of community supports and our social support. We know that many of our community members rely on chosen family members to provide that piece. So it's really important that we think about ways of bolstering those connections and making sure that our community has the resources and supports that they need. Additionally, if you're a caregiver, right, it's uh, very challenging and maybe your caregiving demands you think like, oh, I'm not providing care at the level that, you know, maybe a biological family member is or I still work full time, it's impossible for me to provide, you know, the full level of care that my, uh, you know, the per care recipient needs. Right. So the one of the things that our community can really do, and I'm so glad that glad that Jen and Xander have started the LGBT Caregiver Center, is how do we support our caregivers? How do we make sure that they have access to the resources, the novel technologies that are out there, some of the cutting edge work that's available so that we can make sure that you can get all the support that's available to you to help at least make the caregiving experience a little more uh, inclusive and welcoming, but also right customized to your needs and to the person you're caring for. And then as part of this, we need some policy change, right? The Equality Act, some other pieces to prevent discrimination against LGBTQ plus people in our health care settings is greatly needed, as well as we need to build some community programming to support our community, especially those that may develop dementia or are helping to care for someone with dementia. So as I had mentioned again, what where could we start with helping? Well, we know that 53% of adults who are LGBTQ plus and are having memory or thinking concerns don't talk to their healthcare provider about it, right? And so this is one place we can start is finding welcoming and inclusive healthcare settings, healthcare providers that are knowledgeable, right, to support our community. We need to think about novel ways to remove barriers, right, so that we can ensure services are of high quality, they're welcoming, as well as really a focus on the continuity of care. That's a huge challenge I hear from the work that we've done with people living with dementia and their caregivers, right? They start a program and then it closes, or even the challenges with the pandemic, or finding out that a setting isn't welcome to LGBTQ plus people. Often the challenge is the other people using the services and not the staff. And so there needs to be some changes at the, you know, to the culture of these institutions to make them more welcoming. We need to increase access to care and involve partners, chosen family members and friends in designing care plans that are tailored to the needs of the individual. And then I'm so thrilled that you're here today and we need to keep thinking about more ways we can support caregivers. And so there's been a lot of work uh, that's out there in terms of right some of the key areas and we hope to hear from you more today on like what are some of your concerns what are the things that you want to hear about what we've been hearing is right people are concerned about how do I navigate some of the challenging behaviors that happen with dementia in terms of how my care recipient is responding to their care or some of the challenges or just the emotional toll that it has on having problems with your memory and thinking. We also need to keep our community engaged, staying active, right? Things like going to museums, going to parks, going to, you know, uh, other social events, sports games, all those things you love. It's important to realize even if someone's having memory or some type of functional issue, they still benefit. We talk about it as being in the moment is more important than worrying about 
right? The long term, like, are they going to remember the event? That moment is still impactful. Healthcare, making sure that caregivers have access to healthcare is a huge piece. We know that caregiving has a, a physical and emotional burden on the body. Even though you are, you know, doing this and, you know, you may not view it as a burden, it still involves stress. It's still as another full-time job for many, right? And so we need to be thinking about ensuring that you can get this care, the safety for your loved one or your care recipient and making sure that you also get some respite. So some unique work that's coming out, I'm actually working with a group out of San Francisco to create one of the first LGBTQ focused um, adult day programs. It's called a community day program where it is going to be tailored to the culture of our community from the moment you walk in the door. And so this is some really exciting pieces. I'll be doing some research with them on it. And so you'll I'll be bringing this back to um, Xander and Jen to share on some of the best practices that we're learning about. How can we make some of our long-term care settings more inclusive and welcoming? Well, I think the first start is to design them with LGBTQ plus people in mind. And so that's some really great work that San Francisco is doing. So I'm gonna close up with just sharing some resources because I know I've talked about some of the, the challenges, the hardships that people face both with having dementia, but also right with caring for someone with dementia. So I want to share some resources that we know about that are currently out there that I wanted to encourage you to access if you haven't already. So the first one is the SAGE hotline. It's an elder hotline for LGBT elders. And basically this hotline is for any person who wants to talk with a friendly responder. And so this is basically, it's a toll free hotline. I believe it's available after hours, but you'll have to check. But it, what it is, is it has responders that are certified in any crisis response, right? They're able to connect you to resources that are available. They have a wealth of resources that cross the, the gamut of healthcare, transportation, legal services, you name it. So that hotline is a really wonderful resource. The other one I wanted to encourage is Sage Connect. So Sage Connect is really unique. It's a uh, friendship line where people can get involved and actually uh, just get in touch with people across the country for a conversation. Um, it's just a great resource. So if someone you know is looking for, wants to have a phone buddy to chat with, I would definitely encourage them to sign up for this. It's just a great way. It's very inclusive. I actually volunteered um, and I've been talking with one community member based in New, um, New Mexico for a while. So it's a really great resource that I wanna encourage you to check it out. There's also through the Family Caregiver Alliance, uh, this Caregiver Connect there. And so this has some great resources that you may wanna access. Um, I know that Xander and Jen are going to be building some additional ones, so this is just one to kind of fill the space until others are there. Um, also, if you're looking for, there's a list serve that's out there for caregivers. Uh, it's an LGBT community support list serve, um, and so check that out. And then finally, out of San Francisco, but it's offered nationally, is a 24-7 friendship line that's offered by the Institute on Aging out of San Francisco. So this is another opportunity for social engagement. Finally, if you're looking for an LGBT center or someone else is looking for one, I wanted to encourage you to check out Centerlink. They're a partner with us on several of our projects, but Centerlink connects over 186 LGBT centers in 46 states, as well as Washington, DC and Puerto Rico. So it's just a great resource if you're looking for a community center or, or ways to get more involved in your local community, you may check out one of these centers. And then finally, there is Diverse Elders Coalition. I like this. It has a great resource page uh, with some fact sheets and tips for caregivers, as well as um, current concerns with the COVID-19 pandemic. There's some great tips there. 
Then finally, I'll give you a few additional ones. Uh, there is the trans line, which you can click this link or go there, and it's a national online transgender medical consultation service. So that it offers healthcare providers. It basically has a list of healthcare providers that provide affirming care to the trans community. And um, they can also connect you with case consultations for groups that might be um, looking for that. Uh, the next Jason, one. Jason, can, can, yeah. we, can we move to wrap up there? Because I know you have some resources tied up through the end and I want to be sure we can. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. There's <laughs> also the that. trans lifeline and the elder locator line. And then finally, if you're wondering about a facility, a healthcare facility, and wondering if it's inclusive, I wanted to encourage you to check out the human rights um, healthcare facility search. So these are some of our next steps, which Whitney is going to talk about. We are still recruiting for this equality and caregiving research that we're doing. So if you're interested, please feel free to check that out. And I'm done and I will pass this over to Whitney. Thank you, Dr. Flat. Yeah. Hopefully uh, people can maybe post questions to you in the chat box and you can respond to them in the chat box. Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. Hello, Dr. Wharton. Hi, thank you so much. So, uh, it's always hard to follow Dr. Flat, And I think we have uh, about 11 minutes left. So I just wanted to make sure, you know, I don't want to go through, you know, kind of a, a slideshow for things that might not be, um, you know, as helpful for some of you on the, on, on the call. And, you know, before pre-COVID, if I was walking into a room and there was this amount of people, I would be, this would be my favorite type of group to walk into. So, uh, you know, it, it is small enough to kind of lend itself to questions and to be able to um, answer individual questions. So, um, you know, I, I work very closely with Jason and we have a number of um, research resources that I'll, I'll just tell you very briefly about, but I, I really do just want to hear from you all and see if you have any questions for us or any resources that you're looking for. Um, and also how you found out about us, I, I guess. So how you found out about the podcast and how we might help you moving forward. So, um, you know, you're, you have found out from, from all of us, um, you know, a little bit definitely from, from Jason about some background in LGBTQ um, aging health. And, um, you know, we do have some active resource uh, some active um, resources and research opportunities going on. Um, a lot of them are online. Some of them are in person. Um, and just depending on what your time and your availability is, um, we would love to speak to the six of you for, um, you know, if you, if you have interest in those, um, in those research opportunities. And, you know, this is a, um, a, a call for, um, caregivers and LGBTQ caregivers and people that are interested in LGBTQ caregiving. So um, that is the focus of what our, our research initiative is doing, as well as the aging population. So um, if you have an interest in that, whatever that may be, please reach out to us. It's, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be for a, um, to participate in a study necessarily, or to um, you know, do, do anything like that. But um, if you want to collaborate, if you are looking to learn more, um, we are a, and, and Jen and Xander and Jason and myself are, um, can be resources for you. Um, because as much as we would like to have a ton of work going on, you know, simultaneously in this space, there really isn't a lot right now. And this is how a lot of us have met each other through small groups like this. And, um, you know, we are small in number, but we are very powerful and we are very driven and we are very intelligent. So, um, and we, a number of us have resources and now we have a lot of resources from the National Institutes of Health as far as research goes. So um, please do reach out. So, 
um, you know, in the in the eight minutes that we have left, um, I would love to just open it up to the floor and see if um, any of you might have any questions um, for anything that that Dr. Flat or um, you know any sort of research um, questions or just anything in general about peer giving. I know we have a lot of things. I'm not sure if y'all are fielding things in the chat. Yeah, I was going to say we have a question that came in that says, have have we seen any studies that specifically address the ways the pandemic is changing the picture of aging and dementia risk for the LGBTQ communities? There is not a lot yet, right, that's come out in terms of our community. Um, we do know broadly, right, its impact on things like social isolation, difficulty for caregivers to access respite with a lot of the adult day programs being closed, um, as well as, right, challenges for a while with some of the um, aging care facilities not allowing anyone in. So loved ones, right, you weren't able to interact with them at the same way. Um, so those have been some key pieces. I think also what's unique is, and researchers are studying this, but I'm not, uh, and I don't know if Whitney's done any work in this space either, but um, we know that the having COVID-19 has an impact on the brain. And so there have been concerns about if you've had COVID-19, will that change your risk for dementia? And we just don't know. We don't know yet, right? It's a, a long-term disease that develops and it's too soon for us to say, um, but we're definitely concerned. Uh, they've been talking about, you know, some of the, the cognitive disability that people experience after having COVID-19. So just to add on a little bit, um, the thing that we do know in really, so, so I do a bunch of biological marker research. So I look in blood and in spinal fluid um, for indices that are related to health. And then I also look at the concomitant sort of um, structural, socioeconomic, sociodemographic, and caregiving resources um, that, you know, are, that are sort of affiliated with the biology. So, um, you know, we, we do know that the, what's called the cytokine storm, some of you might have heard about that. So, um, what COVID does is uh, essentially it's kind of like uh, an autoimmune disease almost. So um, you have a number of um, red and white blood cells in your body. <clears throat> and then the white blood cells and the T cells um, start to increase the inflammation in your brain. And it's there to help you. And that helps you get rid of the disease, but there's something that is lasting. And it seems that there is something lasting as far as um, individuals who are, have dementia or people that have severe depression, especially untreated depression. Um, so, you know, kind of the, the, the long and short of it is, um, you know, get vaccinated with the booster. Um, it's safer than, than, than getting COVID. I will, I will tell you. So the, I have a neuro hospitalist that does a lot of the lumbar punctures for my, for my clinical trials. And she was in this morning and, um, you know, she said, it's just, it might, it might be bad again. So just forewarning, if you're, if you're able to get vaccinated and get the boosters, um, it might not be a bad idea to do that. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Um, one, another question that came in is, where do you all see the field of caregiving in academia? Could we be doing more to centralize the topic to a more focused range of fields? That's a great question. So um, Emory, which is where I am in Atlanta, um, we actually have uh, a, it's an NIH funded center and it's specifically on caregiving. And it's caregiving for um, dementia. It's caregiving for um, individuals with HIV and AIDS. It's caregiving for sort of secondary um, types of families. So, you know, if you were married before, but, you know, you're maybe your ex-wife or, you know, your ex-husband or your ex-partner um, gets COVID or gets HIV or AIDS or gets dementia, you know, what do you go care for that person? Like, what do you do? 
So it's sort of unique caregiving needs. And that is what it, what the purpose of this center award is. Um, and I know that that now, because, um, you know, the, the caregiving needs as Dr. Flat went through, um, you know, it, it just, just dementia in, in general, um, that the cost is insurmountable to what, what is going to be needed to care for individuals with dementia. Um, and then, you know, compounded with that, you have people that work full time, people that care for their children, people that care for their neighbors, their friends, there are families of choice. Um, it's just a lot. And um, I know that the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute on Aging are starting to recognize that and be able to provide resources, which Dr. Flat went through some of those. Um, but I do think, I mean, absolutely, it's, it's, it's going to take a village for the, for the amount of people that are going to be um, afflicted with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And um, getting old is as hard as it is, um, is hard in and of itself, even if you age um, without dementia, but for sure, um, you know, take advantage of some of those resources that, that Dr. Flat shared. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question is, do you see opportunities, changes, or threats through the pandemic to the organizations who did this work previously? Do you understand the question? Maybe the, the asker can ask. Do you see opportunities, changes, or threats through the pandemic to the organizations that did this work previously? Maybe economically? I'm not sure. Jason, what do you think? I don't, don't know enough about that issue to really, you know, what's happening. You know, I've been hearing about the federal recovery funds that are supposed to be distributed. But I don't know if you all have seen any of the funds in your community right now. I think it's just being held by the political leaders. So I'm not really sure. And I know there are a lot of people that are hurting. Uh, and it appears, at least in our region, we're hearing from our community uh, organizations that people aren't donating as much, right? So a lot of their fundraising campaigns have not been as successful. So that's concerning to me in terms of some of these groups that are leading this work. Right, will they be able to sustain it? But I don't know if that's a regional issue or if it's something that is happening across the nation, but something to explore for sure. Absolutely. Well, we are at about one minute's time. Um, I don't see any other questions other than there was somebody that wanted both um, uh, Dr. Flatt and Dr. Uh, Warden wanted your email addresses. I put your university email addresses in the chat box. That was for Roger. Um, there's going to be a conference going on in, um, in Central Texas on LGBT caregiving. So uh, be on the lookout for, for an email from Roger. Well, I wanted to um, thank everybody for joining us today on the webinar. I hope that you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you all for uh, the support of your loved ones. If you are caregivers, please do be sure to visit the LGBTQ givers, uh, uh, caregivers website and Facebook page. Um, and we put a lot of those links into the chat uh, box for you. Um, if you would like to go and, and, and gather those up really quickly. Um, the caregiver website is lgbtqcaregivers.org. Um, at the very beginning um, of the chat, I posted some uh, links. Let me repost them since they probably got buried um, to our YouTube page and to our Facebook page. And I also want to thank Drs. Um, Wharton and Flat for, for being present with us tonight and sharing a, with us all this really great information, very useful information, especially the resources. And also just for the fact that, um, you know, it is Family Caregiver um, Month, and it's also Trans Awareness Week. And as a trans man who's a, who's a caregiver for my father with dementia, I just want to say thank you um, for, for all this information, because it's, it's personally very helpful for me. Um, and and so I, I just want to say thank you um, for all of that. Um, somebody's asking if they can see, if they can get copies of your slides, Jason. Sure, yeah. If you want to email me, you can feel free. I'll send you a, a copy. I'll have to like PDF it or something so I can share it. Um, might be a Google Drive link, but I'm happy to share it. 
I will put, uh, I will repost your email right here at the bottom so people can, can grab that up. But thank you everybody, really appreciate all of the, um, all of the questions and the engagement and thank you for, for presenting both of you, Dr. Yeah, and Flag. thanks all to being here and we hope to see you at future events and thanks for supporting um, this work and doing the care that you're doing.